So, hello and welcome to the recording of the ultimate analysis, which is also known as elemental analysis or elemental distribution and the proximate analysis as well. Notice the terminology is proximate, not approximate. Very different things. So basic cold quality, we cover a, a bunch of things and um, we're gonna see all three of these components uh, used together. Um, we'll do calorific value at a later date. However, uh, if we look at ultimate analysis, it's a combination of the primary elements, the carbon, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the sulfur, and the oxygen. Uh, they all have utility in that it's desirable to know what the values are because those values are used in decision making. And that's what you're going to be doing is making decisions. The calorific value is also needed. Um, and that'll be a, a third uh, experiment that we will do. For the proximate analysis, it has four components. Um, moisture, uh, volatile matter, uh, fixed carbon, and ash. And so there is no ash in coal unless there might be some volcanic ash perhaps or uh, some forest fire ash. But there is mineral matter that transforms into ash. And again, these have a great utility in determining um, the appropriate use for coal or other things. And of course, if you read a good book chapter, that'll be very evident. So in combination, we certainly look at environmental issues, certainly things like nitrogen and sulfur even now carbon dioxide. Um, there are trace metals as well uh, and uh, for certain ranks of coal. And coal rank is a classification system. It is not a ranking. Um, so never discuss ranking, only discuss rank. So the classification system is very helpful in getting like behaving coals into the same sort of classification bins. Uh, and so certain of the coals are also uh, used in coke baking, and those can be considerably more valuable. So basic coal quality. So one of the things that we'll get to later in the course is about getting a representative sample. There are multiple approaches to uh, sample from coal. When I've gone into mines, we have done the full seam uh, channel sample for the coal sample bank that we have here. Uh, sometimes might get a core sample. Um, column samples are very difficult to uh, obtain, uh, very expensive and challenging, but a channel sample of a lithotype perhaps might be doable, or even perhaps a column sample of a lithotype. So this is a banded coal, it's probably a bituminous coal, and we see multiple uh, horizontal layers. Uh, those coals from each layer are going to be somewhat different. And so when you mine the seam, you're going to get different quality of material. Now there might be a seam above it, might be a seam below it, and so uh, my quality might uh, change as we uh, continue the mining process. And so uh, knowing these factors is very important. And so you need to get a representative sample for the analysis, otherwise it's problematic. The ASTM International has multiple, this is just uh, four examples. It's selecting from a truck, from a rail car, rail car etc uh, etc et and so these are uh, procedures which have to be um, appropriately done in the right order the right equipment uh, in the right manner to get these representative samples we're also going to go down and, and uh, later in the course and talk about uh, the comminution process and getting down to using rifflers and crushing uh, to get down to smaller particles coating and quartering things like that uh, to take a large amount of material to then get a smaller a representative amount of material that we can do the analyses on. Our analyses are typically done, or ASTM requirements is uh, minus 60 mesh. And if you don't know what that is from your earlier courses, you should look it up, um, but we'll discuss it later. So here's a good uh, visual of proximate analysis. You can see the uh, low rank coals are over here in yellow and greens. So the yellow would be the lignite, the green would be subbituminous, and you move over into uh, bituminous and anthracite. Not sure what the red one is, very low volatile bituminous for some reason. 
can see that low rank coals have a con considerable, considerable amount of moisture. There are some coals in Australia that have more water in them than coal. And so by an American definition would not be coal. It could be water contaminated coal, I guess. Um, we don't have lignites that are 50% water as shown here but very often. Uh, it's closer to 30%, 34%, um, might be high. But the moisture declines as you transition in the rank range. Um, again, the ability to hold that water uh, is lost during the colification process and there's compression pushing it out as well. Uh, volatile matter, of course, is, is variable. So this is, everything adds up to 100%. So the volatile matter yield here um, may only appear to be a little less than 20%, but if we were to dry the coal, we would get considerably more. So you can see that the volatile yields tend to decrease. They're very low in anthracites, very difficult to ignite them. Uh, and as we can see, the transition in fixed carbon going up as well. Notice that we are not showing the mineral matter or the ash yield. And so this is on a mineral matter free basis. It's very important to always tell me when you're discussing coal, uh, what basis it's actually on for us to make logical decisions. Uh, we don't put that in rank because the amount of mineral matter in a coal is dependent on depositional environment and other aspects uh, and is unrelated um, really to the uh, coal forming process. There are uh, some exceptions, mineralization in the cleat system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but um, it's just very variable and it's not part of the organic component of the coal. I know Sarah, when you put the sources being the USGS, it's not really enough information to find that. Um, and so I really should have put the title of um, that resource as well. So put your resources uh, down when you do uh, presentations, you know, your sources of information. Don't use a URL because that doesn't give me an indication of quality. If you know that USGS is the United States Geological Survey, you know that's a very reputable resource to use for coal. So here's the calorific value. So the, uh, the energy content is a very low level way of saying things. It really isn't an energy content because um, the physicists would get upset. Uh, not that I'm opposed to upsetting physicists, but it's not really energy content. It's the um, energy released through the combustion process or perhaps gasification, et cetera, et cetera. But if you uh, do the combustion oxygen, you can see that we have a very variable uh, calorific value. Uh, it increases um, until we hit low volatile bituminous coal, it's a transition point, and then decreases. Uh, it's increasing here because we are losing oxygen from the structure of the coal and a few other things. Uh, and so the carbon content is becoming uh, concentrated uh, as well as a little bit of the hydrogen content and it declines because of loss of hydrogen in the formation of the anthracites. And so we can use this value to cluster the coals to get a sense of how well they'll behave, but we can only do it up until about this mark here, 14,000 BTUs, because above that we can't really tell the rank. So how do we know the rank? Well, this is from um, the ASTM International. It's D388. I haven't supplied you with this, I don't think. And so you should go and look it up. And you can see that there's two ways of uh, determining rank. You can look at the fixed carbon or the volatile matter. Um, if you do that, it's on a dry and mineral matter, a dry but mineral matter free basis. Um, or the volatile matter. And then we can for the higher rank coals, we can um, determine the rank uh, for values less than that uh, 14,000 BTUs. And that's on a moisture containing but mineral matter free basis. Um, because moisture obviously has a role to play uh, in the difference between uh, gross and net calorific value. Notice that also we're not just discussing anthracites, bituminous, subbituminous, and lignite, that there are subclassifications. Again, that has implications for how the coal is used 
and you need to look into some books to determine how that is. So here's a good example of putting the source appropriately, STM International D388. Uh, the Dash 17 tells me that it was released in or re-released in the year um, 2017 and the title of the standard. Again, um, every coal is unique. Uh, this is a Van Crevelin diagram, the atomic uh, H to C ratio versus the atomic O to C uh, ratio. And you can see as you start off with lignite, you get quite a broad span. Uh, throughout the coalification process, you tend to be losing oxygen. And then a little later in the higher ranks, you tend to lose a little bit more uh, hydrogen. There is considerable spread. Every coal is unique, um, but we like to have an idea of how it will behave. And that's why we do a classification system called rank. Again, not ranking, but rank. So discuss coal rank. I would refer to the lignite in the subbituminous this region as low rank, so low hyphen rank. And this is bituminous and anthracite as high rank, so high hyphen rank. There's a lot of hyphens in the low hyphen, bituminous, low volatile, sorry, low hyphen volatile bituminous coals, or the high hyphen volatile bituminous coals. And again, there are subclassifications uh, for very good reason, and you need to work out why. So how does uh, things like caloric value and sulfur get used? Um, here's one of the older uh, rules now. We're in a position of transitioning this to even um, uh, lower uh, values. Uh, but we were allowed 1.2 pounds of sulfur dioxide per million BTUs. Uh, it was restricted to some of the larger uh, entities. And so if you're mining coal from the Northern Appalachian close to us, uh, you have to do something to get it below these line, this line, and you have choices. Or, of course, you can move and uh, perhaps use some powder of base and coal instead because it has lower sulfur, but it also has a lower calorific value. So you need to buy more of it. Now, this stuff is cheap. This stuff is rather expensive. Um, but there are restrictions, too, in the design of the boiler for what you can do. There's a lot more uh, regulations now regarding uh, for smaller and smaller units uh, for being in compliance with our lower sulfur emissions. And there's choices in how to get there. So it's not just about how much sulfur there is in coal. It depends also on what that calorific value is. So heteroatoms. Oxygen, um, it lowers your calorific value. Um, if it your coal gets oxidized by sitting out in the weather and the rain. It will impact your coking properties. Uh, it impacts your water holding ability through hydrogen bonding. Uh, obviously, we get oxygen from the plant material. So biomass is actually quite oxygen rich. Uh, and obviously, from your combustion course, you know that we like to use the oxygen content for the excess air calculations as well. And generally, uh, as you increase the carbon content, there is a pretty much linear reduction uh, in the oxygen content. Nitrogen is obviously going to give you NOx to some degree. It's not 100%. Uh, some of the nitrogen gets retained. Some of it gets converted to other things. Uh, it doesn't vary a lot with rank. It um, varies a little bit more with the uh, biomass inputs and things like that. Um, you don't tend to select coal based on nitrogen values like you do on sulfur. Sulfur, of course, is going to give you sulfur dioxide emissions. Uh, obviously, both sulfur and NOx contribute to the acid depositional challenges. Uh, sulfur is more complicated because it's both organic and inorganic. And so things like pyrite as well as sulfur being in things like dibenzofuran type of structures. Um, there's not a lot of sulfur in the, much of the biomass that uh, we typically use. Uh, but sulfur-based bacteria in the uh, depositional uh, process, so in the bogs, uh, can cause uh, increases. Inland sea as well have, have higher um, sulfur levels. If we're talking about um, fuel, uh, we now have low diesel sulfur. Uh, the diesel was helpful for lubricity, um, but now uh, you have to do different things. Anyway, so the heteratoms are important for emissions and for behaviors. There are a whole bunch of conversions and corrections when we do elemental analysis to uh, convert things to from an as received to a dry basis. Um, obviously, if you're looking at hydrogen, you get some contribution from hydrogen from the water that's not the hydrogen in the coal structure itself. 
uh, it's in the water in the structure and so obviously oxygen is much uh, higher um, molecular weight or atomic mass than hydrogen so that's where this 0.119 comes from and so there are various corrections that you need to do to the data because when we do the combustion process to get the uh, yield of products that we analyze the mass that we weigh isn't pure coal it contains mineral matter and perhaps moisture and so there's a lot of conversions and corrections that are necessary for the exam you need to know how instruments work as well as how to cor uh, why corrections are done uh, and to do the corrections for the report Here's an example of one of our uh, elemental analysis. This is the leco, which is uh, about to be replaced because it keeps dying. Um, you can see there's two components. There's the CHN component on the left and the sulfur analysis on the right. Um, this is just a higher furnace temperature is the, uh, the reason why. Now, this is taken directly from, um, uh, I don't think it's from the STM. I think it's the, uh, instrument manufacturers um, site. Uh, but do not copy and paste and put quotations in your report. It's unacceptable. You need to rewrite these things and obviously cite the source. So what do we have here? This is the uh, sample loading uh, location. A known mass four decimal places gets put in a tin cup or an aluminum foil sort of ball. Uh, system goes through a whole bunch of purges um, we do a whole bunch of blank runs uh, necessary to um, sweep nitrogen from air out of the system, make sure all the temperature, the sensors are up to temperature, make sure the ovens are at the right temperature. And so we run in a few blanks, depending on how long the system's been sitting without a run. Uh, and it background uh, values of things like nitrogen come down, down to acceptable values. So it's not um, really a blank. We don't do a correction. We just... Uh, really do that as a means of conditioning the instrument, but it's called a blank in the system. There's a primary furnace at 950 and an afterburner furnace at 850 degrees C. We use ultra high purity oxygen. And so once the system has been flushed with helium, we have oxygen uh, flushed with helium, sample drops onto a tray. The system continually then uh, flushes with helium to get rid of the air that we just got introduced. Uh, and then when the system is ready to go, that uh, shelf retracts, sample falls down into the primary furnace. We have a combustion process. Uh, we get complete combustion um, by going through the uh, afterburner. We do have some other complex um, controls uh, that we can change how the flow of oxygen happens if things are particularly difficult to burn or if they're easy, like biomass, um, we can uh, slow down the flow and things like that. That's a bit of a detail. You can't just look at the first bit of gases coming off. It's very different from the last gases coming off because the volatiles are combusting. Uh, then the char is combusting. And so all of that material is collected in something known as a ballast. A coffee cup, uh, coffee can sized uh, piece of apparatus. When things have reached the equilibrium and so the combustion process is finished, then small portions go to infrared detectors. Um, take about three cc's. And we do infrared, so it'll be a Lambert law for carbon dioxide and water. Um, nitrogen oxides do not all have infrared um, stretches and bends and waggings, etc. Only some of them, you know, those molecules. And so NOx gets converted back to nitrogen. And so it goes through a reduction uh, location, a reduction furnace with copper. Um, and we use thermal conductivity to determine the nitrogen. For the sulfur, we do um, a different furnace. I think I have a slide later. So minus 60 mesh sample, infrared for CO2, infrared for H2O, thermal conductivity nitrogen. Sulfur is also done by infrared. Um, there, instead of doing um, a ballast collection, it's an integration over time over the um, collection of the data. Oxygen is determined by difference. So this means that there's um, uncertainty in all of these, but there's greater uncertainty in the oxygen, uh, propagation of errors. And of course, if we're making decision on things like the sulfur content, then we need to know what the uncertainty is uh, or the variability uh, 
essentially in that data. And so part of what you do is you're gonna collect data, you're gonna manipulate it, you're gonna correct it, you're gonna present it in a manner that makes sense to communicate your decision-making process. And part of that is knowing uncertainties. So read the STM, it's very helpful. So conditioning runs, moves there before we do anything else. Uh, we have to do calibrations. Um, you wanna use a calibration that's close to the um, say carbon content of the material you're using. So maybe a different calibration if you're using char or coke uh, than you would for a low rank coal. Uh, and so we do a, uh, take a number of known values. So we can talk about accuracy when we know particular values. And so we can set up a, uh, a graph that shows this is the content and this is the response factor for carbon, for example, or sulfur, and we do that. Over time, um, the values change a little bit, and so one of the things you do is put in a known sample, um, and you do that, say, every tenth sample or so, uh, and you can look over time to see how that value changes, and you can correct the drift, which is essentially just moving the calibration line down a little bit um, to get back to the correct value, because calibration takes a whole day. So just doing a, a slight drift um, correction is relatively small. So sample again, minus 60 mesh. Uh, you may dry it prior to, or you may not, but you need to know what that moisture value is. You need to know what the uh, ash yield is or the mineral matter value. Um, and so we know the sample mass to four decimal places uh, and it goes through the uh, burn profile for the combustion. So, um, Here's an example of how hydrogen content might be used. This, this is Silas chart. And so you have this band of how the coal behaves. Again, this would be a low rank coal. This would be a high rank coal. Um, you can also get a sense that you can also plot the oxygen uh, transition um, here as well. Um, and from the carbon content or from the hydrogen content, you can get a sense of what the carbon content is. You can get a sense of where in the classification scheme or the behaviors um, that the coal will fall. Notice that this is given on a dry mineral matter free basis. Always tell me the basis, otherwise you will get yelled at. Um, we can do things like predict the high heating value uh, from the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur uh, content with a correction for the ash yield. So a whole bunch of things that you can do and be predictive if you knew what the elemental composition is. Moving on to proximate analysis. Uh, this is a glorified oven. Um, we flow nitrogen through it. Um, there is a crucible and it has a cover. If you say there's a cup and a lid, I know that you haven't read the ASTM or that you're not an expert or because you're not using the lexicon of the field. And so use the right terminology. It has a particular uh, shape to it. It's very specific and uh, there's a reason for that as well as having a cover. I don't think the cover is necessary anymore, but I think it's still there um, as a historical holdover. Though perhaps there are a few coals, um, cooking coals particularly, perhaps where it might be helpful. So uh, glorified oven. If you look inside, you'll see we've got all these crucibles. Uh, one crucible will be very clean. Uh, it's in the first position, and that's just to uh, get weighed continually um, throughout the process. And it allows us to know what the constant weight is as the temperature in the oven changes. And so we do uh, typically triplicate analysis, sometimes more. We do that for elemental analysis as well. Remember, it's important to know uncertainty. And there's one balance here, and so essentially this carousel rotates and it weighs each crucible. So you weigh it when it's empty, you add a sample, which is typically around one gram. Uh, again, we know the value to four decimal places from the balance. Uh, there is precision and accuracy in the balance, which is uh, important. Uh, and once the uh, crucibles are all been weighed, we know what the mass is. Again, triplicate analysis typically, uh, perhaps more. Uh, the uh, oven then goes into a heating mode. There are some desirable heating rates that's listed in the STM. Uh, and as nitrogen flows in and it 
uh, has to exchange the volume of the oven a certain times, uh, number of times per minute. Again, take a look at the STM. Um, we continue anyway way until we get no significant uh, mass change. And as we've heated up to 105 degrees, there's a range, I think uh, you're allowed, um, but about 105 degrees Celsius, uh, then you can determine what that mass is. So moisture. So once you've got the moisture, uh, the lid goes on. And so that whole process, the, uh, uh, the cover, I'm sorry, goes on. The lid of the instrument opens up, allows you to put in the cover with the tongs. Um, the oven lid when closes, uh, it's heated up to a uh, temperature of 950 degrees Celsius, I think. And uh, typically that would be done um, for seven minutes. I say with lids, I really should say with covers uh, to get that right. Again, it's an inert atmosphere. We're looking at what material come off. So don't talk about volatile matter content. We should talk about volatile matter yield. Once that occurs, then it cools down uh, to about 600, 700 degrees Celsius. Um, the lid of the instrument will open. This allows us to remove the cover uh, and allows then the lid of the instrument to close. Um, the oven is heated back up to 750 degrees Celsius. The gas then changes to oxygen and we remove the leftover fixed carbon, leaving the ash behind. And so we generate an ash yield. And from those three values, we can determine the fixed carbon by difference. So this is typical data that we'll give you. We have the initial mass. The ch this is the uh, uh, mass after the moisture has been lost. And so it's the difference. Um, I think the rest are actual direct measure masses. Uh, but check with the TA when you're in the lab. And you can see we've got multiple analyses and you each work with a different uh, data set. So do take a look at that. Um, I've only talked about coal, but we do the same thing with biomass. Biomass is obviously used as an energy generation um, fuel, uh, typically biomass waste, although sometimes we're now deliberately going biomass to be a fuel. And so it's uh, applicable for both coal and biomass and biomass pellets and things like that. And then that's the mixtures. Again, there are corrections. We have um, a desire to know what things are on in different bases. So sometimes we'll talk about as received. Sometimes we'll do dry, um, dry ash free. And so this is just like saying um, in a classroom of 30 students, um, if 10 of them were female, then on a male student basis, there would be 20. It's nothing more complex than doing some simple calculations along those lines. But we need to know what the basis is. If I ask you how many students there are, you don't know the answer because am I talking about in the Pennsylvania state system? Are we talking about in University Park, in the incoming freshman class, in energy engineering, or in room 220 Hammond on a Tuesday, you know, the 2nd of September. Um, and so I need to know what students were talking about. And so I need to know the basis. And it's just exactly the same when we talk about um, values. So is the fixed carbon, does it include uh, a contribution from moisture or is it not, et cetera, et cetera. So is it as received, is it dry? Is it a dry mineral matter free basis? The mineral matter um, goes through some interesting transformations. Uh, and so it is not the same value as the ash. Uh, some minerals gain weight, uh, mass, some uh, minerals lose mass. Uh, and so you need to know some things like that. So um, where's the lab and what time? We do a staggered start. So please go and take a look at the sign in sheet might well be in Canvas if you're looking at this lecture online. Obviously, you need to dress appropriately. So it's long pants, it's closed toe shoes with socks. I don't want to see uh, exposed skin. Um, again, it's the standard behavior in industry. We're going to give you a lab coat and glasses. Uh, put the glasses on immediately as you enter or you'll get poked in the eye. 
don't um, have hats, again, it's a fire risk. Uh, no chewing gum, it's a poisoning risk. And if you chew gum, I will poison you. So that's a double enhanced risk. And no food or drink because, again, you'll die. Um, approximate analysis, we're going to obviously have hot surfaces. Um, and so be careful when dealing with the covers. And there's a potential crush injury or impingement injury when the uh, lid closes on the oven. Um, <clears throat> so that's it. Thank you very much.